Stanford University.
Change it.
Oh, jeez. Come on, dude. Get the kite up. Let's get it on TV. Woo! <laughs> 
Time. I'm going to go to that place up by the stage and you can take your time and wrap that.
Ring out wild bells to the wild sky. Ring out the old, ring in the new. Ring out the false, ring in the true. O oh God, eternal spirit of all life, on this very special day, the 119th commencement of Stanford University, may we stop living from one minute to the next. May we step back from worries and cares, from tasks and duties, from the ordinary pressures of life. May we here and now take a larger view of life. We celebrate the personal growth and transformation that lie behind us, behind those who graduate today, but also behind the rest of us as parents and relatives, as friends and mentors, as professors and staff, and other members of the Stanford community. Before us lies the future, one of great hopes and dreams, but a future unseen and untested. As we commence life anew, May we, in the words of the poet, ring out false pride in place and blood, the civic slander and the spite, ring in the love of truth and right, ring in the common love of good. Ring out the old shapes of foul disease, ring out the narrowing lust of gold, ring out the thousand wars of old, ringing the thousand years of peace. May our education free us from repeating the mistakes of the past, personal and collective. May our acquired knowledge and our evolving understanding guide us so that the things that matter most are not at the mercy of the things that matter least. And may we act wisely and generously so that in the end it cannot be said that our lives were lived in vain. Amen. Graduating students, faculty, colleagues, graduating students. <laughs> Faculty, colleagues, former and current trustees, government officials, distinguished guests, family members, and friends, I warmly welcome you to the 119th commencement exercises of Stanford University. And a special welcome to the incredible class of 010. and to our graduate students from our various schools. Today, we shall award 1,722 bachelor's degrees, 2,100 master's degrees, and 980 doctoral degrees. The undergraduate class of 2010 includes 365 seniors graduating with departmental honors and 272 graduating with university distinction. 33 students are graduating with dual bachelor's degrees and 110 with both a master's degree and a bachelor's degree. Throughout its history, Stanford has attracted students from around the world. This year, 102 members of the undergraduate class of 2010 are from 45 countries outside the United States. And 955 candidates for the master's and PhD degrees represent an amazing 75 countries outside the United States. Now, you may have noticed that I started out this morning with a lot of statistics. But before you jump to the conclusion that I do so because I am a computer scientist, that's OK, too. Let me say that reciting these statistics is an historical tradition at our commencement ceremonies. Of course, every tradition was at one time or another new. 
and hence really not a tradition. Some started as political or cultural responses to the stuffy traditions of the day. But after a while, they often became ingrained and sometimes even a bit antiquated. But the wacky walk, which many of you just observed for the first time, which has become a storied part of Stanford lore, will never become antiquated. This balancing of old and new, the innovative and the traditional, is a challenge that universities have faced for hundreds of years. Universities are prized for their traditions and are often the primary home for discussions and debates about the ancient and timeless questions facing humanity. At the same time, universities must look forward. They must be bold as they contemplate the future and their opportunities. Our first president, David Starr Jordan, in his inaugural address in 1891, reflected on this balance when he said, it is for us, as teachers and students in the university's first year, to lay the foundations of a school which may last as long as human civilization. It is hollowed by no traditions. It is hampered by none. Its finger posts all point forward. Today, 119 years later, we have established some traditions, but we have not forgotten President Jordan's exhortation. We remind, remain mindful of the need to reinvent and move forward. As you leave Stanford, I hope you carry a deep appreciation of the values and traditions that are everlasting, as well as a willingness to be bold and to approach challenges with a fresh perspective. It is with the recognition that traditions remain vibrant when they are enthusiastically embraced by succeeding generations that I now invoke a very special Stanford commencement tradition. Graduating students in the, class, in the stands are many of those who have made your Stanford years possible. Parents and grandparents, spouses and children, siblings, aunts and uncles, mentors and friends. Whoever played a role in helping to get you to Stanford or in supporting you and encouraging you once you were here. I invite you to please stand, turn to the stands, and join me in saying thank you. And now I will turn the program over to Provost John Echemendi, who will present the University Award winners. It is my pl pleasure and privilege to present the Walter J. Gores Awards for Excellence in Teaching. Recommendations for these prizes and for the Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Awards and the Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Award were considered by a committee of faculty, students, and staff. I would like to ask the Gores Award winners to come to the stage at this time. The Gores Awards were established by a bequest from Walter J. Gores, a Stanford alumnus of the class of 1917. Gores was a dedicated teacher who strove for excellence during his 30 years as a distinguished professor at the University of Michigan. The Gores Awards recognize excellent teaching at the undergraduate and graduate level, as defined in the broadest sense, to include lecturing, discussions, tutoring, advising, and course development. Teaching is a complex art, as well as an essential cornerstone of university life. I will call each recipient forward to receive his or her award, and I ask that you hold your applause until I have announced all of this year's award winners. The recipients of the 2010 Walter J. Gores Award for Excellence in Teaching are Sherry D. Shepard, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Co-Director of the Center for Design Research, and Associate Vice Provost for Graduate Education. Glenn Lee Katz, Lecturer in Civil and Environmental en Engineering. Andrew Bensley Adams, PhD candidate in Computer Science. C. 
Sarah E. Brownell, PhD candidate in biology. On, on behalf of the university, I congratulate each of you for this recognition of excellence in your teaching. I would like to ask the Dinkelspiel Award winners to come to the stage at this time. Lloyd Dinkelspiel's service to, to Stanford University included the presidency of the Board of Trustees in the 1950s and was characterized by an enduring concern for the quality of undergraduate education at this university. Shortly after he died in 1959, a memorial fund was established to endow the Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Awards for distinctive contributions to undergraduate education. I will call each recipient forward to receive his or her award, and I ask that you hold your applause until I've announced all of this year's award winners. The recipients of the 2010 Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Awards for Distinctive Contributions to Undergraduate Education are Julie C. Lithcott Hames, Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education and Dean of Freshman and Undergraduate Advising. Jennifer Lynn Wolf, Lecturer in the School of Education and the Program in Human Biology and Director of the Undergraduate Minor in Education. Alicia Tara Talani, senior, majoring in human biology. <laughs> Karen Patricia Warner, senior, majoring in human biology and political science. On behalf of the university, I congratulate each of you for the significant recognition of your contributions to undergraduate education. The Gores and Dinkelspiel Awards are joined by a third, the Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Award for Exceptional Service to Stanford University. I would like to ask the Cuthbertson Award winners to come to the stage at this time. This award was established in 1981 to honor the late Kenneth Cuthbertson, one of the early architects of Stanford's long-range financial planning and development programs. The sole criterion of the Cuthbertson Award is the quality of the contribution that the recipient has made to Stanford. This is a fitting, lasting legacy to a man who cared deeply about the university and its values, and whose contributions continue to benefit each and every one of us today. The recipients of the 2010 Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Award for Exceptional Contributions to Stanford University are H. Craig Heller, Lori I. Loke, Business Wire Professor of Biology and Human Biology, John C. Brovman, Freeman Thornton Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, Bing Centennial Professor of Material Science and Engineering, and Professor of Electrical Engineering by courtesy. On behalf of the university, I congratulate you for this distinguished recognition of your exceptional service to Stanford. For the past 11 years, John Brovman has been the face of undergraduate education at Stanford. In two weeks, John will be leaving the farm to become the 17th president of Bucknell University. We will all miss John at Stanford, but we wish him well on his new journey. Bucknell has chosen well. Please join me in thanking John for everything he's given to Stanford. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this year's commencement speaker, Susan Rice, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and a Stanford alumna. 
Stanford has always encouraged its students to use their education in order to promote the public good. And certainly, today's speaker has exemplified that tradition. The first African-American woman to serve as the U.S. Permanent Representative to the U.N., Susan Rice has been breaking boundaries and surprising people her entire life. As a young girl growing up in Washington, D.C., she was exposed to education and public affairs issues at an early age. Her father was a former governor of the Federal Reserve System and once taught economics at Cornell. Her mother was an education policy researcher. Frequent visits to her home by scholars and public officials included Madeleine Albright, and that heightened her awareness of politics. In her senior year in high school at the National Cathedral School, she earned the nickname SPO, short for sportin', for her athletic prowess, especially on the basketball court. Rice surprised her parents when she announced her college choice. She would be going to Stanford. <laughs> to say that her parents were less than thrilled would be an understatement. Her mother, a Radcliffe alumna, cried. But Rice was undeterred. At Stanford, she excelled. She earned her degree in history in 1986 and was a Truman Scholar, elected to Phi Beta Kappa in her junior year. She was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship and went on to earn her PhD at Oxford University. While here on the farm, Susan Rice pursued interests outside of the classroom as well. This was where she met her husband, fellow student Ian Cameron, during freshman year. She also led a divestment effort to protest apartheid in South Africa, establishing an alumni fund to be used to persuade the university to redirect its investments. During President Bill Clinton's administration, she worked as a staff member on the National Security Council. In 1997, she was named Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, with responsibility for U.S. policy for 48 countries in sub-Saharan Africa and the management of 43 U.S. embassies. In 2000, she was co-recipient of the White House Samuel Nelson Drew Memorial Award for distinguished contributions to the formation of peaceful, cooperative relationships between states. She joined the nonprofit Brookings Institution in 2002 and continued her work on the implications of global poverty and failing states. From 2007 through November of 2008, she served as senior advisor to Barack Obama's presidential campaign. In nominating her to serve on the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations, President Obama said, Susan has been a close and trusted advisor. Her background as a scholar on the National Security Council and the Assistant Secretary of State will serve our nation well at the United Nations. The U.S. Senate unanimously confirmed her in January of 2009. Madeleine Albright, a family friend and mentor who has known her since she was a 5'3 point guard, once described Susan Rice in this way. If I were to characterize her, said Madeleine, whether it's playing basketball or anything else, she's fearless. We are proud that a Stanford alumna is in this vital role and we are especially honored that she agreed to return and address her graduates. Please join me in welcoming Susan Rice, Ambassador to the United Nations. Good morning, Stanford. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Hennessy, for that very warm introduction. It is wonderful to be back at Stanford. Having gotten around a bit over the last few years, I am more convinced than ever that this is the best university on the face of the planet. It's particularly gratifying to be back in this stadium 
which is a rather special place for me. It happens to be the spot where my husband and I had our first romantic moment. <laughs> it was... <laughs> it was just as the band was playing All Right Now. But my kids are in the audience, so I'm not going to give you any more detail. <laughs> Stanford has had an enormous impact on my life. Not only is it where I met my husband, but it's where I met the people, took the courses, and championed the causes that ultimately led me to a career in international affairs. Stanford also taught me focus and discipline. Once you've learned to study in a bathing suit on the grass with muscled men throwing frisbees over your head, you can accomplish almost anything. <laughs> Let me join President Hennessy in recognizing the parents here today. For many families, you kids have been living far away from home. I grew up in Washington, D.C., as you heard, and it is not a lie to say that I think my mother just got over my decision to come to Stanford about three weeks ago. <laughs> I still understand the pride that you have in your children must know no bounds. You've made enormous sacrifices to enable your kids to get such a tremendous education. So this is your day, too. Parents, grandparents, family, and friends, thank you for all you have done. Now, class of 2010, first and foremost, congratulations. I suspect you're feeling pretty good about yourselves. I remember feeling pretty good about myself, too, when I was sitting in your seats. In fact, I might have been feeling a little bit too good, judging from how much I remember of my commencement speech. <laughs> Hold on to this jubilant moment and cherish your memories of this extraordinary place. Nurture the friendships you've made here. The warmth and security of Stanford can sustain you as you face an economy still climbing out of a deep hole and as you enter a world changing at a furious pace. Imagine the world and what it will be like when one of you comes back a quarter century from now to deliver the commencement address. In 1986, when I graduated, the Soviet Union was bristling with 45,000 nuclear weapons, and the Berlin Wall was impenetrable. Nelson Mandela was clocking his 23rd year in prison in apartheid South Africa. Osama bin Laden was fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, and Al-Qaeda didn't exist. Almost nobody had heard of global warming. Japan was the daunting economic powerhouse, and China's share of global gross domestic product was 2%. There were some 30 fewer countries in the world and 2 billion fewer people on the planet. We've seen amazing technological advances. In 1986, only 0.2% of the U.S. population had a cell phone, which were bricks about 10 inches long. IBM announced its first laptop, which weighed 12 pounds. 24-hour cable news was in its infancy. The face of America has changed, too. In 1986, 8% of the U.S. population 
was Hispanic. Today, it's about 15%. The number of African Americans serving in Congress has doubled, and the number of women and Latinos has tripled. And if on my graduation day, someone had told me that I would live to see the first African American president, much less serve in his, can in his cabinet, I would have asked them what they were smoking. So much change has transpired just in my adult lifetime, and you will see so much more in yours. But it doesn't just happen. Progress is the product of human agency. Things get better because we make them better. And things go wrong when we get too comfortable, when we fail to take risks, or seize opportunities. Never trust that the abstract forces of history will end a war, or that luck will cure a disease, or that prayers alone will save a child. If you want change, you have to make it. If we want progress, we have to drive it. Technology and trade help transform a bipolar world into the deeply interconnected global community of the 21st century. Yet the planet is still divided by fundamental inequalities. Some of us live in peace, freedom, and comfort, while billions are condemned to conflict, poverty, and repression. These massive disparities erode our common security and corrode our common humanity. We cannot afford to live in contempt of each other's welfare. It's not just wrong, it's dangerous. When a country is racked by war or weakened by want, its people suffer first. But poor and fragile states can incubate threats that spread far beyond borders. Terrorism, pandemic disease, nuclear proliferation, criminal networks, climate change, genocide, and more. In our interconnected age, a threat to development anywhere is a threat to security everywhere. That makes the fight against global poverty not only one of the great moral challenges of all time, but also one of the great national security challenges of our time. So here's my challenge to you. Become agents of change. Be driven by a passion to lift up the most vulnerable and to serve those with the least, both at home and around the world. For me, for so many reasons, this is a personal as well as a professional imperative. One of those reasons is a little boy whom I met in war-ravaged Angola in 1995. I don't even know his name. He was one face in a friendly, a friendly mob of destitute little kids who greeted our delegation at a dusty camp for internally displaced persons in the middle of nowhere. He was perhaps three or four years old, with pencil-thin legs and a distended belly and only a torn t-shirt to wear. But he stood out because he had the most amazingly infectious smile. I walked up to him before realizing that the only thing I had to give him was the worn baseball cap that I was wearing. I took it off, 
and put it gently on his head. The joy on his face remains etched in my mind to this day. But I had to leave that camp. And when I did, I left that little boy in hell. I like to think, and I sure hope, that kid is OK. But he could well have become one of the nine million children under the age of five who die each year, mostly from preventable and treatable afflictions. Yet he has every right to live with the same dignity, hope, and security that my own son enjoys. They're both children of God, of equal worth, equal consequence, and equal rights. That little boy's future is tied to ours. Our security is ultimately linked to his well-being. So we must shape the world that he deserves. That child deserves a world without the poverty that crushes the dreams of hundreds of millions. Half of humanity lives on less than $2.50 a day. That child deserves a world without extreme hunger and dependence that it fosters. So we are investing in building poor countries' capacity to feed themselves. Agricultural research has produced stronger crops that yield more, adapt faster, and better resist drought, disease, and pests. Yet Africa's crop production remains the lowest in the world. With your generation's leadership and ingenuity, you can make it the highest. That child deserves a world where everyone can get a quality education. More than 70 million kids are not enrolled in primary school today, and 60% of them are girls. You can help close this gap by joining Teach for America here at home or the Peace Corps abroad, by providing lunches for rural girls' schools, by working to end child labor, forced marriage, and human trafficking, and by creating educational systems that reach all of our children. That child deserves a world in which we find new cures for old plagues. You can be the generation to develop new vaccines for tuberculosis and HIV AIDS, to use nanotechnology to create smart therapies that kill cancer cells and leave their healthy neighbors untouched, to provide needle-free immunizations to stop pandemics in their tracks. That child deserves a world whose climate is not collapsing, whose air isn't choked by soot, and whose waters aren't polluted with spewing oil. Imagine, imagine deploying clean energy technologies to poor countries to power development without fossil fuels. Much as China and Africa largely skipped landlines and leapfrogged to cell phones. You can be the generation that makes a green economy reality that turns the fight against climate change into a boon for the developing world, not just a burden. You can be the generation that actually reverses global warming. That child and every child deserves a world of greater opportunity, democracy, and hope. And that is the world you can help forge. Sometimes we innovate in great strides. Sometimes we progress by slow and steady advances. But progress we must. The fight against poverty is a challenge worthy of your generation that grew up in this interlinked age. 
the goal of a world free of famine and mass misery may seem distant, but once so were the moon and the microchip. The aim is ambitious, but so are you. As you go about changing the world, continuously challenge yourselves. Get out of your comfort zone. Go travel the world we share. Learn more languages, get grit in your eyes and sand in your hair, and service in your soul. Graduating from Stanford is great, but it's just the beginning. So don't settle on a single path too soon. The last time I really was sure I knew what I wanted to do with my life was my senior year at Stanford. I was sure I wanted to be a United States Senator. I left for Oxford, certain I would go on to law school. To round myself out, I decided to study international affairs. After Oxford, I decided to skip law school, but to sample the business world at McKinsey and Company. And I did so precisely because I was never any good in math, and I had literally never met a spreadsheet. I've not followed a preordained path. Rather, I've tried to push myself, stretch myself, and learn new skills that would serve me whichever path I took. I've changed course, and I've taken unexpected turns when my gut dictated. That's led me to places I never expected, but I'm grateful I've been. So focus on what stirs your soul, because it's hard to excel at anything that you don't love. Be fearless. It's hard to make progress without breaking a little cockery. And don't be afraid to go down fighting if you're fighting a righteous battle. Stick to your guns and to your principles. Remember, you should never want something so badly that you do something you don't believe in to get it. And at the same time, don't sweat too much what other folks may think of you. As Dr. Seuss said, be who you are and say what you feel because those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. Be about more than money. Comfort and economic security are good, but they're not enough. You should be about creating change, not just counting it. And finally, as you're changing the world, never neglect family. They're not just your foundation. They're the source of life's greatest fulfillment, as all the parents here can testify. Both my parents were recently struck by serious illnesses. My colleagues were tremendous about stepping in for me at the halls of the United Nations. But nobody could step in for me or my brother at the hospital. There's usually someone else who can do your job, but there's nobody else who can be a loving child or a devoted parent. Like those before you, your generation will contribute. It will innovate, and it will serve in unique ways. But today, change is coming faster than ever, and you must shape that change. You can be that change, not for an election, but for a lifetime. If you remember nothing else of what I said, try to remember 
that little boy. Remember that he is somebody's beloved son. Remember that he counts as much as any of us. Remember that we cannot afford to sleep easy while he suffers. Remember that you can make his life better. Above all, remember that each, each of us, each of us has a profound responsibility to try with all of our skill, all of our smarts, and all of our soul. So make him safe, make progress, and make us proud. Congratulations again, and Godspeed. Thank you, Ambassador Rice, for that truly inspiring address. Will the provost please come forward to present the candidates for degrees? Mr. President, first I have the honor to recognize all those who have completed the requirements for master's and doctoral degrees. They will be presented to you by the deans of their schools. Will the candidates from the School of Engineering please stand? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Science, Engineer, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Yeah. Will the graduates from the School of Engineering please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Law please stand? Okay. And I should say, Ambassador Rice, we're happy to take you at the law school if you'd like to come. <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Doctor of Jurisprudence, Master of the Science of Law, Doctor of the Science of Law, and Master of Laws. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Law please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Education please stand? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts Master of Arts in Teaching, Doctor of Education, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations.
With a, grad, with a graduate from the School of Education, please be seated. Will the graduates from the School of Humanities and Sciences please stand? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts, Master of Liberal Arts, Master of Science, Master of Fine Arts, and Doctor of Musical Arts and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Humanities and Sciences please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Earth Sciences please stand? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Science, Engineer, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Earth Sciences please be seated. Will the candidates from the Graduate School of Business please stand? <laughs> Mr. President, <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts in Business Research Master of Science in Management, Master of Business Administration, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Business please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Medicine please rise? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for Masters of Science Doctor of Medicine, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the trustees and faculty of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. <laughs> Will the graduates from the School of Medicine please be seated? Mr. Provost, have we forgotten anyone? I, I think we're done. Oh, no. <laughs> now, Mr. President, I have the honor to recognize all those who have completed the requirements for undergraduate degrees. Will the recipients of the degree of Mass Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, and Bachelor of Arts and Sciences please stand?
By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon each of you the bachelor degree and admit you to its rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates please be seated? Graduates of Stanford University, on behalf of the more than 200,000 Stanford alumni around the world, I congratulate you and commend you. This is a day of celebration, and you have certainly earned it. But before we close, I would like to reflect for a few minutes on a phrase you heard several times this morning. As each group of students was presented to me for the conferral of degrees, I responded by admitting you to the rights, responsibilities, and privileges associated with a degree from Stanford University. We believe a Stanford education brings with it a responsibility to make good use of your knowledge and to work to make the world a better place for future generations. Today, you join a long line of distinguished alumni who, like Ambassador Susan Rice, put their education to good use. I have made it a commencement tradition to close with a small talk about a member of a Stanford family who took his or her responsibilities to the next generation seriously. Eunice Kennedy Shriver, Stanford class of 1943, was such a person. A sister of a president and two senators, mother of California's first lady, Eunice Kennedy was the fifth of nine children of Rose and Joseph Kennedy. She arrived at Stanford in 1941 as a transfer student, earning her bachelor's degree in sociology two years later. Eunice Kennedy, the young woman who learned the jitterbug from fellow students at La Guanita, would become recognized the world over as an unrelenting advocate for the mentally disabled and the founder of Special Olympics. Her relationship to her sister Rosemary, institutionalized the same year that Eunice arrived at Stanford, inspired her life's work. In 1962, she wrote a landmark article for Rosemary, about Rosemary for a national magazine. The year before, under her leadership, the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation played a key role in President Kennedy's panel on mental retardation. That led to the establishment in 1962 of the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, now named for her. That year also marked the establishment of Camp Shriver. After learning that children with intellectual disabilities were not accepted at summer camps, Shriver opened up her Maryland farm to about three dozen children. She believed deeply that these children had much to offer, that they could be exceptional, and was outraged by their lack of opportunities. The Special Olympics were established in 1968, just weeks after her brother Robert Kennedy's assassination. Chicago Mayor Richard Daley said at that time, Eunice, the world will never be the same. And it wasn't. In 1987, she exhorted the young athletes who convened for the Special Olympics World Games by saying, you are the stars and the world is watching you. By your presence, you send a message to every village, every city, every nation, a message of hope and a message of victory. 39 years after that first Special Olympics World Games in Chicago, that message was celebrated in China, a country with a history of discrimination against the disabled. More than 7,000 athletes were welcomed to the 2007 Special Olympics World Summer Games in Shanghai. Today, more than three million people in 180 countries throughout the world train and compete in the Special Olympics. Over the course of her life, 
Shriver's efforts also led to the establishment of research, service, and training centers, advancing the care and education of the mentally disabled across the country. She was recognized with countless awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, this country's highest civilian honor. Eunice Kennedy Shriver's life exemplified the Stanford spirit. She was driven by a deep desire to make a difference. She changed people's lives for the better. She pioneered a worldwide movement, opening doors for people with disabilities and transforming attitudes in the process. Today, I hope that you leave here with a strong reservoir of that Stanford spirit, a spirit that inspires you to make your own contributions to the world and that brings you back often to this special place between the foothills and the bay. Thank you and congratulations. For all who are able, I invite you to stand or remain standing for our benediction. Beloved graduates of the class of 2010, proud family, mentors, and friends, we bless these moments and these years for all that we have learned, for all we have loved and lost, and for the quiet ways they have brought us nearer to our invisible destinations. May these long-awaited endeavors completed help us remember those whose very lives depend upon the quality of our work, the generosity of our spirits, and the preservation of our common world May you inspire all of us to pursue our passions, our dreams, to risk that which seems impossible, approach the world with wonder and delight in knowledge given to cherish and to share. Go now and may passion inspire you, may injustice trouble you, May hope comfort you. May friendship nourish you. Go now in peace. Live simply. Be gentle and at home with yourselves and others. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Act justly. 
speak honestly, draw closer and confidently to new realms of possibility. And as you go, may you find the right questions to ask. May you give more than you have received. And may you know the depth of your knowledge, of your compassion, now and in the days to come. Each beginning demands an ending. Every ending promises a beginning. Now is such a time. May God bless you and keep you, grant you wisdom and courage, embrace your hearts, and sustain your souls. Go now and begin your new journey today and every day in peace. Amen.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.